So the goals of the software engineering world is we need to sort of move up that ladder. And pretty much science works that way of trying to go um, in that sort of approach. When we look at the evolution of physical theories, and you say, how do physical theories uh, progress? I think most people, especially from the way it's taught at school, get the impression that uh, physical theories develop this way. We start at the, forget the dates for right now, but you start at the beginning with a lot of uncertainty of what your theory is doing. And as you chug along generating papers, generating results, more and more scientists, you get closer and closer to uh, certainty. We know what the theory is. Well, it doesn't quite work that way. And I gave a talk, I think it was at NCAS, about 10 years ago looking at physics, and I took this slide from that talk. This is sort of what physics has gone through. In 1870, physics was a solved problem. We had classical mechanics explained everything. But then we started getting into electricity and studying of light, and suddenly we had this concept of quantum mechanics, you know, of quanta of light, uh, the light wave duality, and suddenly everything that was so well known at this point got a little bit chaotic. Well, then we came up with the Bohr atom, the, the so-called solar system of the, of the nucleus and the electrons circling around it, and we had a better picture of thing was go, uh, things were happening. Schrodinger's equations explained the wave-particle duality, and then you end up with, but then you end up with superzi super, superposition, the concept that where you have a, a light is both a particle and a wave, and things got a little bit chaotic again. And then, uh, now we're getting past what I know about <coughs> physics, but you know, in 1970 we have the many worlds view, which said, oh, we sort of know what's going on. But then we have a problem today that quantum theory or quantum mechanics really explains what's going at the subatomic level. Relativity really explains how galaxies seem to be moving around one another and how light seems to work. The problem is those two theories are incompatible. And we like to think that they're both true. So there's a problem there, you know, that, that, that uh, relativity and quantum mechanics both describe the same world, the same reality, yet they're incompatible. So physics is some sort of a turmoil. So you have all this work going on now in string theory and multi-dimension spaces. And you know, sort of the big, the big goal of the physics world is we want some sort of unified field theory. How do we combine everything into, you know, you know what is gravity? You know, can we really understand it? So, and these, these, uh, the level of uncertainty, these are only sort of approximations. But the problem is, the important message is science progresses, gets somewhere, gets confused or doesn't understand everything, learns a little bit more, gets closer to certainty, then something else pops up. So I think um, I, my conclusion to this is that, you know, physicists are, are never going to have to worry about not, you know, I never have to worry about running out of a job. There will always be something more complex that they haven't quite understood as we get further along in understanding more things. Another concept looking at um, <coughs> generating theories and uh, out of, uh, observations is you have the file draw concept. Let's assume uh, we have some hypothesis that with no treatment this is your life cycle, this is how long you're going to live, and with some sort of treatment you're going to live this long. And this is all the data. You know, this is the, da the, da this is the age when people die. <coughs> the problem is if you believe this, you know, if a scientist believes the, these results, um, anything that's appearing here you say, well that didn't work, so let's not publish it, let's leave it in my file draw. And what you typically get is this is what gets published. That's why it's called the file draw you know, concept. The bad studies don't get published. Or another way of looking at it, often these studies won't get uh, published because the, editor, the reviewers will say, well, it didn't work. Who cares? <coughs> so there's a sort of a bias in publications that lead towards stuff that works. So this makes it look like the treatment works a lot better than maybe it does because look, the data is way over there. Um, so by hiding some uh, observation, it skews the results. Um, and personal experiences uh, are the same. For example, if we're now going to look at the life cycle of people, and after, let's say this is 75 years old, we'll run this 10-year study, and now 10 years later the newspapers will go in and, and interview the people and say whether the system works. Well, they'll interview all these people and say, gee, it really works. Well, what about interviewing all these people? 
know, they're no longer here. They've died. And that's one of the problems with anecdotes. You know, you just, you're looking at a biased population. Um, these people are all gone, so they can't say the system didn't work. Um, so that's one of the reasons why anecdotes really are very bad uh, ways of proving something, because you just sort of a very biased sample. Richard Feynman, your physicist, uh, if you're doing an experiment, you should report everything that you think that, make, that might make it invalid, not only what you think is right about it, other causes that could possibly explain your results. So his view of publishing research is you want to publish everything about it, both the good and the bad. But the journals won't take it. They won't okay. take that, all that negative information. That's true. And that's why I'm saying there are things wrong with the whole process. I mean, that's one of the things we need to realize. A report written by Dennis McBride um, was called Best Available Science. And I took a few comments from him that I think is very relevant to what we're talking about here. Uh, he wrote a report that looks at if you're in a policy position, like in government, and you need to come up with some sort of science-based policy to do something, how do you find evidence? And he classified evidence at three levels. You can deal with personal opinions, you know, ask the experts, but they're often, they're often a good guess if you take the right experts, but they're not really a theory or, or truth, you might say. Or, um, so personal opinions he lists as sort of the lowest level of scientific validity. Then he has what he's called gray literature. Those are the reports you'll see uh, a lot on the, on the web, prepared by government agencies, advocacy groups, trade associations. And you need to be suspect, because there's, not, there's no vetting of the, of the technique. It's just a report someone wrote. It may be very good, it may be very bad, but there's no quality control on it. Uh, Google searches, I'd often put in that category. You search a topic on Google, you get thousands of hits. How do you know what you're hitting? You know, you, you, so there's really a School should be teaching this now. How do you use Google effectively as opposed to just typing in a command and you know, a query and seeing what comes out? How, do you, how are you able to check the, you know, the, vet the, the site you're looking at? And then publication in peer review journals is sort of considered the, the gold standard. Um, but peer reviewing is the start of the validation process, not its completion. Peer reviewing doesn't mean something is true. It's the start of the, of the process where the information is now public, where changes and corrections you know, could, could work. And typically, you know, as you go down this list, they're typically better. One of the weaknesses in the whole process is it depends upon peer reviewers. Um, it's the, and it depends upon the qualification of the reviewers, the independence of the reviewers, I'll talk about more of these in detail. The transparency of the review process and the consensus process. What are the problems with peer review? And this is sort of basis to the whole publication industry in the scientific world. And many, in, not so much in computer science, but in some fields, papers are, are blind reviewed. That the paper is submitted without um, the author's name being sent to the reviewers. And the problem is the subject is so specific with few reviewers or most reviewers have a conflict of interest.